my god, you missed this major plot point. Like, I'm trying. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Kelsey. I'm the creator of Bite Size Ancient History and a recent graduate of Cambridge University. This is the fifth video in a series where I've been looking at historical films and commenting on the historical reality and historical fiction from the movie. I've been doing this because I studied classics at undergraduate and then Egyptology at master's level at Cambridge. So if this is something you're interested in, don't forget to like the video and subscribe. And if you generally are interested in historical content, don't forget to go check out all of my socials. For today's video, we're going to be talking about the 2004 film called Alexander. And I'm just going to preface now that I absolutely loved the film. <laughs> Um, and I really enjoyed it and the point of these videos is not to critique and slander any of the historical accuracy because ultimately when you make a film it's not going to be 100% accurate because it would make for a very very boring film. <laughs> so instead I kind of balance it out and see why they may have changed things and praise when it is very accurate. If you've seen the film, you'll know that it is a very long film. Not making it bad, because again, I really enjoyed it, but it's three and a half hours long. Because of this, I'm only gonna pick out a few key points within the plot and a few key characters, because otherwise we would be here for days and I don't think anyone's gonna enjoy watching that. Before I get into my analysis, I'm just gonna give a very quick plot summary. And as I said, it's a very long film, so this summary will not encapsulate the entire plot of the movie because there's a lot. So please don't be one of those people down in the comments like, oh my god, you missed this major plot point, like I'm trying. But you try and summarise three and a half hours worth of content into about two minutes. I didn't mean for that to sound as sassy as it came across, very sorry. Okay, three, two, one, let's go. The film Alexander is based on the historical figure named Alexander the Great, which even if you're not very familiar with ancient history, I'm sure you will have heard his name. Famously, he is the Macedonian leader who conquers about 90% of the known world at that time and unfortunately dies at a very young age. The film is narrated by the character and historical figure of Ptolemy I and his narration starts in around 283 BCE in Alexandria, Egypt. Before getting into the actual plot details of his life, he starts to give a little bit of a summary on his character type and the fact that his great character has emerged over time and been twisted and tainted to make him the great. But this does not mean that he wasn't an amazing person, just that much of the accounts and details we have are kind of a mythical retelling and over-exaggerate. The fact that he is dead at this point in time is no spoiler because within about the first three or four minutes of the film, we flash to his death and he is lying on his deathbed in Babylon. During this scene, we're informed of this large empire that he has created and the fact that they don't know who it will pass to once he dies. With this established, we go all the way back to his childhood. We meet his mother, Olympias, and realise that they have a very close relationship, and much closer by comparison to that with his father, Philip of Macedon. Philip instead is depicted as an abuser towards Olympias and shows complete disregard for his son. We also see how he is being partially raised by his tutor, Aristotle, and this may be another name that you will be very familiar with as one of the famous Greek philosophers. Another important relationship that is established is with him and his friend Hephaestion. And I say close relationship, we see that they are friends from a very early age in their childhood and that across the years this develops into a sexual relationship between the two. Another important character that I feel is worth mentioning is his horse Bucephalus. <laughs> This horse is just as mythical and remembered as Alexander himself, as a horse that he has from a very young age in his childhood right up to adulthood. In the film, we see how this is depicted as an untamable horse and that nobody would want it, but of course Alexander himself manages to tame it and then it becomes his horse forever. Slightly later, we see how his father is remarrying a woman named Eurydice. With this new marriage, we see that Olympias is not happy because this is the first woman that Philip has married who is actually of Macedonian blood, i.e. whoever she then births would be a true Macedonian heir. 
By comparison, Alexander is not, because his mother Olympias is not from Macedon. This creates a level of threat to his legitimate claim to the Macedonian throne. With their marriage, we see them having a party as a celebration. Naturally, what else would you do? And Attalus, the uncle of Eurydice, is very outspoken at this party and states exactly what I've just said, the fact that whatever child she has will have a stronger claim to the Macedonian throne. Generally, the way he's speaking is basically already ousting Alexander and his mother, so this unsurprisingly does not go very well. So Alexander kicks off and ends up being exiled along with his mother. However, their feud is kind of resolved over time and after a short period of around six months, Alexander and his mother return. However, at another family's wedding celebrations, Philip is assassinated. With this assassination, we're not exactly sure what's happened, but there are many hints that it may have been planned by Olympias herself. Because Eurydice and her children are still very young, the throne naturally passes to Alexander. We then encounter Alexander's first major battle over in Babylon to defeat the Persian king Darius. So he is victorious at this battle and the king Darius flees and he takes over the palace of Babylon. There are then many other battles and many other lands conquered because as I said, he conquered around 90% of the known world. In one of these, he also meets his future wife, Roxana. As the time and the years pass, Alexander's men want to go home to their own families. They're not happy with just settling and living with these new lands that they're conquering. This becomes important once they reach India and there is another epic battle. However, this one faces a lot more losses. Alexander himself is injured and unfortunately his horse passes away. This is the final turning point where he eventually agrees to return home. We then see them back in the palace of Babylon and this is when we discover that Alexander is planning to head out on another expedition and to conquer even more new lands. Around this time, his lover Hephaestion also falls ill and we're kind of left unsure with what has caused it. Some hint that it may just be like typhoid from India, while others say that it could be Roxana growing jealous and envious of him and poisons him. Eventually he dies and as throughout the plot they compare themselves to Achilles and Patroclus, you will know from my last video, which if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Actually it wasn't my last video. The one before last, Achilles and Patroclus, Patroclus dies first and he was compared to Hephaestion and then Achilles was Alexander himself. So once his lover died, he didn't want to carry on, and Alexander does not. About three months later, he dies. And again, we're shown how there are mysterious circumstances surrounding this. We're not quite sure what's caused it. We know that he was drinking, and then about a week later, he died having some sort of fever or illness that's very unclear. The story then returns to Ptolemy the first who has been narrating it. However, Ptolemy admits that it was actually all the men that conspired against Alexander and poisoned him. Ptolemy tells his scribe to erase that and to just leave it. The film then ends with the fact that all of our records from this were lost in the library of Alexandria. And that's the end of film. We're done. If you haven't seen the film and you're going just off that summary, as you can see, a lot happens so I'm just gonna pick out some small details and key points because I cannot analyze everything. Let's start by Ptolemy's description of Alexander the Great and the fact that he has been depicted as this legendary figure as Ptolemy himself says. This is very true, Alexander has become a sort of myth and legend in and of himself so it's very hard to often detangle myth from fact when we discuss Alexander. A key example of this is the fact that he has been described as the son of Zeus and the film accurately picks up on this and it has his mother Olympias telling him from a very young age. While obviously we can't actually say that he is the son of a god, it's very true to historical records like Plutarch and Arian. He is often described as the son of Zeus. We have accounts that during his lifetime he goes to the Zeus Ammon prophet at Siwa and has this confirmed for him. 
There are then also coins after his death where he has the horns of Zeus Ammon to again try and depict the fact that he is the living son, not living, the son of Zeus. For those of you that are slightly confused when I say Zeus Ammon, this is an extension of Zeus that has kind of been collaborated with the Egyptian deity Amun, Zeus Amun Amon. Plutarch again himself in his later accounts describe how Olympias was always telling people that he was the son of Zeus, as the film shows. Let's talk about key dates. As I stated in my summary, it kind of starts with the death of Alexander in 323 BCE in Babylon. This day and location is completely accurate to all of the historical records that we have. And like in the film when they pick up on the fact that we're not quite sure how he died and that there are many conspiracies, this is again agreed upon in ancient historical records. However, like the film, it states that Ptolemy admits that they all conspired to poison him. They mention it in historical records, but most of them agree that this was not the case. The film, however, is accurate in depicting him at a party drinking a large amount of unmixed wine and suggesting that this may have also been the cause. Another key date is the battle against the Persians. And again, this is completely accurate with its date and location. Written records of the battle then also pretty much support and confirm what the film is saying with the fact that it was a Macedonian victory and that Darius eventually fled because Alexander chose to go back and support the flank of his army rather than chasing him here and there. Then 329 to 327 BCE we're told that he continues to chase Darius and conquer new lands of like Sogdia and Scythia before finally reaching Bactria and finding the deceased Darius. Again, this is completely correct. The film honestly smashes it with the dates. I think it's also very good at giving handy details, like during the battles, it kind of labels which part of the army they're showing you, which I think is really cool. Finally, in 32C BCE, we see that they have reached India and have another epic battle. And again, completely right. And the description of the battle and how gory and grim it was is unfortunately very accurate. So far, the film is doing pretty well. Like there is a solid historical record to support and substantiate all of its claims where they've made the film plot. Of course, there's gonna be exaggerations and a natural Hollywoodization of certain themes and like key details, but it's still doing pretty well. So let's try and talk about some of the key characters. Let's talk about Darius or Darius or Darius, however you want to call him is fine. I would say Darius and sometimes I slip into a Canadianism of Darius, but that's fine. Their depiction of Darius is completely accurate. He was the leader of the Persians at this time and he was a force to be reckoned with. However, ultimately he is not good enough to defeat Alexander and he does flee the battle that we see depicted in the film. And unfortunately, according to historical records like that of Curtius, we do know that he is eventually just found dead by Alexander's men. There was some sort of panic and he's accidentally stabbed by one of his own soldiers and is just left for dead, which is a pretty grim but accurate ending. The film shows how this is the first major battle in Alexander's military career and that is completely correct. After this he goes on to conquer the majority of the known world at the time. Let's talk about the kind of end of the film where we know that Alexander's men want to just go home. Yes, this was a very real issue in Alexander's career. He was away from Macedon for a very long time and they started to disagree with a lot of his policies. And accurately in the film, it depicts the idea that he didn't necessarily want to just conquer these lands, but he actually did give it back to its original leaders. Not quite in the glorified white savior complex that they show in the film, but kind of in historical reality, this is what he did, yeah. But of course, he gave back the land, yes, he still took the title of the king or the emperor of that area. He just left the administrative duties to them and didn't really change it. There's also the idea that Alexander himself starts to become a barbarian as he starts to adopt kind of their traditions, culture and their dress. 
And again, this is reflected in historical record. It was a very real worry for the soldiers and one of the reasons that they kind of turned against him a little bit and wanted to leave because they didn't want to leave the Macedonian lives they were living and move over to the east. And yes, this does happen once they reach India as they show in the film. Let's talk a little bit about his family and the figures early on in his life. Firstly, and probably one of the most important ones, is his mother, Olympias. She and Alexander are depicted as having a very close relationship, and this is reflected in historical record. She was very much in control of him from the early years. Like the film, she also claimed descent from the line of Achilles, which is why she calls him her little Achilles and stuff like that, and that's something that he really holds on to, as I said, with his lover Hephaestion. His father, Philip II, again, is his real father according to historical record. And yes, he did only have one eye, it was injured. We think we have found his burial, which is very cool and I can do another video on if you are interested. Let me know down below. But yes, he was also assassinated under mysterious circumstances. So the film pretty much gets that with how it hints that it could have been Olympias, it could have been someone else, we don't know. And yes, he does remarry another woman called Eurydice. This happens around 338 BCE and she is also the niece of Attalus and this supposed party where all of the drama kicks off did actually happen according to historical record. And that is where Alexander is exiled. And yes, he does leave for about six months and ships his mother back off home and then returns. I think another key figure, if not also one of the most important, is Hephaestion. And in the film, they're depicted as being friends from a very young age and training and learning together. This is true. The film then depicts them as growing into lovers and having a sexual relationship. And I have to give the film a lot of credit for this because, again, if you didn't see the Troy film, it's something that Hollywood shied away from there with Achilles and Patroclus, even though there is a lot of interpretations and agreed ideas that they were. Like Achilles and Patroclus, however, we can't substantiate it and say that definitively they were lovers. But that doesn't mean that they're not because the way that sexuality worked in ancient Greece was a lot more fluid than it is today. So it didn't have the kind of labels that we do now with gay, straight, bi, and so on. They just were what they are. There were things that were accepted and not accepted, but it wasn't the defined and rigorously labeled way that it is today. So you don't find historical records really saying they were this, they were that, because they just were. With that said, their association with Achilles and Patroclus is kind of suggestive that there was something happening. And there is a lot of other evidence to support this as well. But scholars are pretty divided on the matter. So I will just give you some evidence that could suggest it in support of the film and then you can make your own decision. Diodorus tells us about an occasion where Hephaestion responds in a letter to Alexander's mother Olympias. And he says in the letter that you know Alexander means more to us, as in the two of them, more than anything. Arian then also describes how Alexander states that Hephaestion meant more to him than anything else and was life itself. Hephaestion is also given the epithet of Phila Alexandros. This can simply mean friend of Alexander, but the Phila can also mean lover and it has been used this way in the past. So. Who knows? Lucian also writes about the fact that Hephaestion sometimes spent the entire night in Alexander's tent and kind of plays on the overtones of what that might mean. Plutarch tells us that Hephaestion also used to read Alexander's letters aloud to him and that when Alexander would interrupt him, he'd place his finger over his mouth to hush him up. And that's kind of the evidence we have. There is more, but I can't fit it all in. So it's up to you to interpret it how you want, but I think you have to give the film credit for actually interpreting it in that way when there is evidence to support it. Aside from him being Alexander's lover, we know that he was basically his second in command and the film accurately shows this and yeah, it's supported in historical record. However, the tension between him and Roxana, who also call like Roxanne in reality, 
cannot be substantiated as much. Just, we know that he kind of supported this union. We have images of him being almost like the best man to the wedding. So that's a little bit more of a dramification of the matter. But makes sense if you're interpreting it as lover and just because we don't have records for it doesn't mean that it didn't happen because it's not something you would write down. His death is depicted pretty accurately aside from the location where he's actually in Susa. And yeah, it is this kind of fever that lasts around a week. However, in reality, Alexander wasn't there the moment he died, which is even more heartbreaking, obviously, than the film. Because he's told that he shouldn't worry about it, like it is in the film, but he actually goes away and by the time he returns he's already died. While the interpretation of typhoid makes sense with some of the symptoms, it doesn't make sense with all of them. So some have since hypothesised that it may have been a poisoning or something else, which the film accurately picks up on. Another important character in Alexander's life is his horse, Bucephalus. And that's not just me being biased, because if you follow me on Instagram, you will know that I am also a big horse person. It actually is. As I said, it's often depicted as another mythological figure in itself alongside Alexander. Written accounts support Bucephalus's existence and the importance that he held within Alexander's mindset. They describe it as this huge black horse with a white star on his head. So the film depicts it pretty accurately. While the exact circumstances of Bucephalus coming into Alexander's life vary, the one that they choose in the film is reflective of a lot of them. Generally, there is consensus that it was an untamable horse and Philip, his father, agreed on this and tried to send the horse away. However, Alexander at this young age recognises that the horse is just scared of its own shadow. He manages to calm it down and successfully tames it. The death of Bucephalus is a little bit more dubious and that's just because historical records themselves can't agree on the circumstances. Some say, like in the film, that he did die as a result of the battle that takes place in India. Others simply say that he died of old age. Generally, the importance that it held in the film to Alexander is reflected in historical record, and this may be simply because he modelled himself as the new Achilles, who also had the horses that could be beaten by no others within the Iliad, but it could also just be because it's the horse that had stayed with him the entirety of his life, and I think that's quite nice. Finally, the start and the end of the film show Alexander on his deathbed and the fact that there is a drama surrounding who will be his heir. And this was a very real issue in the historical circumstances. I don't know how to word that, but you know what I mean. Because Alexander died so suddenly and that at the young age of 32, there was no exact heir. As the film says, his wife Roxanne, or Roxana, was pregnant at the time, but obviously the child had not even been born by the time that Alexander dies. So even once he's been born, he's a baby. He's not gonna take over this massive empire. So in the film, we see how his commanders are begging him to tell them who should take over because they have no idea and they know that if he dies without a proper heir, there is going to be future squabbles and the empire is going to just disintegrate. Diodorus tells us that Alexander's response to this was toi kratis toi. This, as a rough translation, means to the strongest, i.e. give my empire to the strongest. However, some interpreted it as toi krateroi, meaning to craterus, which is one of the commanders that we do also meet in the film. I should also just say as a side note that all the commanders are also very real historical figures and they do very well with that. Ultimately, because they can't even agree on what he said, the empire does disintegrate and it gets split between people called the Diadochi or Diadochi. And these are the kind of heirs of each new kingdom. The film accurately states that it ends up being divided into kind of four main parts. And this is to Ptolemy, to Antigonus, Cassander and Seleucus. Again, because there is no legitimate claim, they continue to fight over his body because whoever kind of buries his body, they think will be the rightful heir. And the film states how Ptolemy I has this over in Alexandria, and this is accurate. 
However, we do not know exactly where it is today because in the later Roman period the accounts get a little confused. So we don't even know where it is today. We can make guesses, but we're not sure. I think that's all we're gonna have time for. I can already sense this is gonna be a very long video. So if you made it all the way to the end, let me know in the comments down below because well done. Don't forget to subscribe and check out my other socials and I'll see you next week. Thank you for watching. Bye.